What's up, everybody? My name is Dimitri Kafinas, and you're listening to Hidden Forces, a podcast that inspires investors, entrepreneurs, and everyday citizens to challenge consensus narratives and learn how to think critically about the systems of power shaping our world. My guest in this week's episode of Hidden Forces is Michael Howell, the CEO of Cross Border Capital, a London based independent research and investment company that provides asset allocation and capital markets advice to institutional investors. Of all the analysts and forecasters I've spoken with in the last several years, Michael has proven to be the most accurate in his predictions for how the economy and financial markets would perform in 2023 and 2024. I asked him back on the podcast to help us understand why risk assets have continued to perform so well in the last two years despite higher interest rates by the Fed, and what these recent all-time highs in gold and Bitcoin prices signal about global liquidity, risk appetite, and investor confidence in the integrity of the dollar and other fiat currencies as reliable stores of value in the face of alarming debt levels that have previously only been associated with wartime economies. In the first hour, we break down the indicators Michael relies on to make his forecasts and why he expects economic growth and inflation to reaccelerate this year and into 2025. In the second hour, Michael provides his forecasts for which assets and asset classes he thinks will outperform during this time, the direction of interest rates, the steepening of the yield curve, and how the expiration of the bank term funding program, the drawdown in the reverse repo facility, and a temporary decline in liquidity from tax payments could create buying opportunities for investors over the next several months. If you want access to that part of the conversation and you're not already subscribed to Hidden Forces, you can join our premium feed and listen to the second hour of today's episode by going to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe. All of our content tiers give you access to our premium feed, which you can listen to on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, which includes Q&A calls with guests, access to special research and analysis, in-person events, and dinners. You can also do that on our subscriber page. And if you still have questions, feel free to send an email to info at hiddenforces.io, and I or someone from our team will get right back to you. Lastly, because this conversation deals with investing, nothing that we say on this podcast can or should be viewed as financial advice. All opinions expressed by me and my guests are solely our own opinions and should not be relied upon as the basis for financial decisions. And with that, please enjoy this extraordinarily timely and illuminating conversation with my guest, Michael Howell. Michael Howell, welcome back to Hidden Forces. Dimitri, great pleasure to be here. Thank you. It's great to see you again, not in the flesh this time, but remotely. You and I have uh, talked quite a bit over the last few years, both online, offline. And the last time, not the last time, but one of the recent times that you presented to our Genius community on December 15th, 2022, was right after you had published the Global Liquidity Report, in which you argued that global liquidity had bottomed and that it was inflecting, that the US dollar was set to fall, and that the yield curve would steepen. I think your Asset allocation matrix of time favored stuff like high yield bonds, defensive stocks, and fixed income arbitrage with an eventual rotation into stuff like equities, emerging markets, cyclical value stocks, and stuff like that. Like I said, you and I have had many conversations over the last several years, but this was one that really I've been replaying in my head for a while because I felt that of all the market analysts I've spoken to in the last several years, your forecasts were the most predictive of where events would lead. And it offered the most compelling theory in retrospect. Like when I look back to understand why we didn't get the hard landing, why we didn't even get the soft landing, why we've gotten the no landing. What do you feel that you got right in your analysis? What has it materialized the way you might have expected and why? Okay, well, a, a lot to take in there. Well, I mean, thank you for the compliments. I mean, I think the plain fact is that the way that we look at the world is very different from most people. It goes back to the time that I was at Salomon Brothers, which was probably my sort of formative years. And the whole ethos that was uh, around at Salomon Brothers at the time, I mean, led by Henry Kaufman, the chief economist, was that you had to look at flow of funds. Flow of funds was the major driver of asset markets and economies. 
And the focus of most traditional economics is actually on something called uses of funds. In other words, people are trying to debate whether capital spending is going up, consumer spending is going up, whatever it may be, government spending is going up. But the reality is what drives that is a stage before, which is sources of funds. So if you start to focus on sources of funds, which can be capital flows, can be central bank liquidity, can be bank lending, can be shadow bank credit creation, all these sort of factors are much, much more important. And what we detected back in actual fact, it was uh, October of 22 when you saw the bottom, was the liquidity cycle, which is all powerful in terms of driving markets and economies, was definitively bottoming. Now, the catalyst for that we figured at the time was the British guilt crisis. And we thought that that British guilt crisis, which you recall was the sell-off in British government debt after the budget debacle that had been announced by the incoming new Prime Minister Liz Truss, that was a wake-up call for Treasury ministers and central banks worldwide because it exposed the fragility of the government debt markets. And above all, what policymakers focus on is not inflation and not employment. It is the integrity of the sovereign bond markets. And that's what their main focus is. And that is what spooked them. Well, so how do you determine global liquidity for people that haven't either can't remember our last conversation when you were on in 2022 on the podcast or who need a refresher? What is it that determines that? Well, I, I'll say maybe two or three things about this I mean, in terms of what it is and why it's important. In terms of measuring global liquidity, what we're looking at is basically the flows of cash and credit through global financial markets. Okay, So that's the metric we're measuring. What are the main ingredients of that? And in other words, what is it that we really focus on? What is the critical elements within that whole picture? And I would say it comes down to four particular factors. Number one is the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve clearly controls the dollar system, or at least it does now. Maybe it was a moot point in in the early 2000s, but it certainly does now. The People's Bank of China, which has grown bigger and more powerful over the years, that's number two factor. Number three factor is cross-border flows of money. Now, they can be things looking at you know what used to be called euro dollar flows in actual fact the traditional euro dollar flows are nothing like as important as they were but cross border flows between countries in general can be a very important source of liquidity as well in the global economy and the fourth factor which is maybe sounding a slightly wonkish point is actually the volatility of the bond markets now the reason the volatility of the bond markets is important is that is because a lot of credit today is collateral based In other words, that it depends on, if you like, a raft of safe assets, and those safe assets provide the ability to leverage credit. Now, if the value of those safe assets becomes uncertain, and the uncertainty is gauged by things like the move index, which is a measure of bond volatility across the US Treasury curve, if that move index starts to go up, indicating higher volatility, the haircuts on collateral will increase and the amount of credit creation will diminish. So it's those four factors which really drive, are the main drivers of liquidity. Why is liquidity important beyond anything else? And that's why I think this is uh, you know, a good point to emphasize. And that is because we live in a world of massive debt. And this is the fact that market participants kind of understand, but a lot of economists don't seem to acknowledge. And the fact is that we're living in a world where there's $350 trillion of debt, okay? The average maturity of that debt is around five years, which simple math tells me that something like $70 trillion has to be refinanced every year. Now, to refinance rollover debt, you need liquidity or you need balance sheet capacity, effectively the same thing. So liquidity in our terms is a gross concept that refers to the capacity of the financial system to roll over debt. And that's why it's important. If you don't get the roll, you get market volatility, you get uh, refinancing crises. Just think of a very simple example of a home mortgage. A home mortgage needs to be rolled at one particular time when the mortgage matures. And when you roll the mortgage, what you really want is to get the roll you're not that interested in the interest rate you're paying, okay? And that's why we think interest rates are secondary out there. What really matters is the availability of liquidity. Is it fair to say that the 2008 financial crisis reflected that when money markets seized up, that that was a reflection of an interruption in the refinancing or the liquidity? Absolutely correct. It was a refinancing problem that particularly hit the Europeans. So as I said, you were spot on in, I guess, 
you could say, calling the rebound that we've seen, the no landing, and your asset allocation matrix, I think, reflects also what has done well since that conversation that we had on December 15th. You also did say that the dollar would fall and that the yield curve would steepen. I don't think the dollar like meaningfully fell. I mean, it had a few dips. I'm curious to understand why that didn't happen or how you explain that. And I think I do understand your argument for why the yield curve hasn't steepened, which I think is central to today's conversation. But tackle both of those for me. Why did the dollar not fall, at least not as much as you predicted? And tell our listeners when you're done with that, why have we not seen a steepening of the yield curve? And in fact, we've seen an inversion and we've seen negative term premia along the curve. Okay. Well, let me deal with the dollar first. I think that you're correct to say that I think the dollar perhaps should have been weaker in our in our book. I mean, that was something, I mean, I'm not going to stand here and say that we got it right, but basically we were thinking of a mild weakening in the dollar. And I don't think that happened, certainly against other paper units. But I think there were a lot of other things that were kind of going on there. If you step back and you say, well, okay, let's value the dollar not against other paper units. Let's look at the dollar against gold or against Bitcoin. And I think you can say pretty clearly there, there's been a massive devaluation of the paper dollar against those assets. And that's what we are thinking of, certainly in terms of a medium term view, that is likely to happen. The same template of maybe the dollar holding up in paper currency terms may also still be with us. And what I mean by that is, you know, if the dollar goes down, what is it going to go down against? And I think that's where you kind of get a head scratching moment because I certainly don't believe that the yen will be a strong currency. We can go into reasons why. And I think if you look at the economic mess that's in Europe, particularly in the wake of the Ukraine war and the loss of uh, or disruption in energy supply to Europe, I can't see for the life of me how the European currency would be strong. So I think that you've got to look at you know what the benchmark is. But I would say that you know number one, the dollar has been certainly weak against those things like uh, gold or Bitcoin. It's weakened a little bit, you know, generally against other paper units. But one of the main things, which we'll come back to again, looking at the economy, the cash flow generation of the U.S. corporate sector has been actually extremely strong, and that's been one of the factors. The return on capital in the U.S. has actually held up remarkably well through this period. So, what about the yield curve? Why has the yield curve remained inverted? for so long as the economy continues to do well, which goes against what you had thought was going to happen, which was going to be a steepening. What explains that? Well, I, I would argue that, again, without necessarily uh, you know, altering the goalposts here, that the yield curve probably has steepened okay, through this period. If you just look at the straightforward, take the 10-2 or the 21-year or something like that, you can actually see the beginnings of a steepening occurring. Now, okay, we may have said, okay, we've had an inversion and maybe that inversion lasted longer. But I would say technically, there's a lot of distortion going on to that part of the yield curve. And you brought up the point about term premia. Now, term premia have been very negative. Now, this is a wonkish concept, and I don't want to dig too deeply into that. But that's been one of the factors that's actually pulled the yield curve flatter and made the inversion. Now, a very simple way of actually understanding the process is to think of what's going on in the mortgage market, the agency mortgage market. Now, the agency mortgage market normally trades at a fairly constant differential between agency mortgages and 10-year US treasuries. Agency mortgages is mortgages sponsored Fannie by Mae, government. Freddie Mac. Right, exactly. So it's the GSEs. So it's basically ultra safe, non-US treasury security paper. Correct. Non-private sector is backed by the government. And the point is, this is a safe asset because the Federal Reserve holds it on its balance sheet. So it holds it alongside treasuries. So these are, you know, these are safe assets per se in normal parlance. Now, what you've been seeing is not just the fact that you've got this differential of 100, approximately 120 basis points between treasuries and more agency mortgages, but actually that spread has jumped hugely in the course of the last 12, 15 months or so. It's blown out by probably double of that at, at the peak. And the question is, why was that going on? So if you look at that spread, what it is associated with is this big dive into bill issuance by the Treasury. So the Treasury switched from coupon issuance, in other words, issuing 
Long-term 10 year, bonds. Yeah, 10-year, 20-year, 30-year, or even five-year debt, coupon debt, and started to issue a huge amount of bills again. And that meant there was a shortage of 10-year, 20-year treasuries. And so if you start to do a yield curve calculation in the normal way between, say, the two-year treasury and the 10-year, the 10-year yield was artificially depressed by this scarcity that had come into the system. Now, if you rerun the calculation and you use agency mortgages instead and you create a synthetic, let's say, 10-year yield based from the agency mortgage market, what you find is the yield curve never inverted. And actually, it's beginning to steepen quite quickly. And the turning point in the agency mortgage spread, if you like, or that created yield curve was about 12 months ago. And therefore, if you look at the normal lead time between what this is telling you, a yield curve steepening and the real economy, bang, you should be getting a revival in the real economy right now. And I think the evidence is showing that. What did you say that spread normally is during an economic expansion? Well, it's normally about 120 basis points. I mean, you, it's a slightly you know, arcane or wonkish calculation to get there. So we make adjustments for duration and for convexity on the curve. But it comes out if you want a number of about 120 basis points. So the Fed has wanted to reduce its holdings of agency MBS in its portfolio. Does that explain some of this discrepancy? It could easily be a factor. I and mean, we know that the Treasury wants to uh, get rid of agency mortgages in its balance sheet pretty rapidly. But I think the correlation, if you look at the correlations between, if you like, the Treasury agency mortgage spread and bill issuance, that's what seems to determine most of the recent movements. So is the view that we should draw from this that you believe that the inversion that we've seen that everyone's been looking at as a recession indicator? It's a fake actually indicator. Just never, it's a fake inversion. It's a fake inversion. But I mean, anyway, I mean, the fact is that the yield curve, or let me be precise here, the 10-2 spread is a very flaky predictor of the economy. I mean, everyone sort of worships that and says it's gospel, this thing always works. It doesn't. I wrote a paper in the Journal of Fixed Income about five or six years ago, I forget, which actually looked at the efficacy of the yield curve as a predictor of the economy. Now, lo and behold, if you look at that analysis, what it shows is, in actual fact, the yield curve is a brilliant predictor of the economy. The problem is you don't know which yield curve. <laughs> sometimes it's the one three-year spread. Sometimes it's the 210. Sometimes it's the 1020. You only know after the event. And what that comes back to, this is going to you know, dive into sort of bond speak, but what that comes back to is that what's really important is convexity on the curve, the degree of curvature. Because if there was no curvature, every single yield curve spread would be the same, have the same slope. But the fact is that what you've got is different slopes at different tenors, different tenor spreads. And what that means is that convexity is important. Now, what I always remember is, if going back to my time at Salomon Brothers, an inverted curve was not the thing that spooked the traders that much. What really spooked the traders, if you've got a flat curve with a big hump around the belly of the curve, that was a really scary thing. So they were saying then that what's really important is convexity. Wait, so you're saying if there's a concavity in the middle of the curve? Correct. A big bulge, a fat belly in the curve, yeah. So if yields in the middle of the curve are higher than they are in the tails? Correct. The distribution. That's the worrying picture. Why is that worrying? I mean, first of all, is experience. That's what they tended to show. But what it would tend to suggest is that you've got the market is expecting potentially a big drop in 10-year or 20-year treasuries. And so you're compensating in mid-duration with an extra premium because you're you're not getting the same capital gain by investing in the long end. So that's a great point of clarification because most people think about the price of government debt in the form of the yield that you receive for holding that debt to be an indication of people's expectation about future growth, about maybe solvency, et cetera. But your point is that it's primarily driven by supply and demand, by flows. Correct. The yield on bonds is not determined in textbooks, it's determined in the market. And that's the key point. No, that's why I love talking to guys like you, actually. You know, I, my background is basically entirely academic. Whatever I know about economics, I learned in college and subsequently through books. So it's always common when I speak to people that have actually worked in the business and have sat at trading desks. It's typical to find a very different perspective than the academics typically do or what we learned in textbooks. So why should we care? Why, why do I care if the yield curve has been suppressed. Why is that important? Well, I think it's telling you that what's going on there is surreptitiously yield curve control. But why do I care if the Fed's suppressing the yield curve? Well, it's 
why do you care? Because what I- are the risks that are introduced to the economy and to financial markets with yield curve suppression? Because I think the reality is, is how they're doing it. And if they're starting to fund a lot of government spending through short-term bills, which is what we're saying, which is the reality of what's happening, and let's say that the money funds or the banks start to buy that debt, this is pure monetization. And this goes back to something that Stan Druckermiller said six months ago when he was being interviewed. There was a well-known interview on YouTube that he expressed these fears where he said, if you look at the numbers that are coming out of the Treasury in terms of the quarterly refinancing statement, those numbers were the numbers that you would have seen in Latin America, not in the USA. This is a warning sign. Okay, this is this is bad. And if the Treasury keeps funding at the short end, or they start issuing more debt to banks, so the banks are holding treasuries, what you're getting is this pure monetization of the deficit. Look at US money supply data now. Money supply, broad money supply in America is beginning to tick up, okay? Everyone says, well, that's great news. Well, let's look beyond that headline figure and drill down into why is it picking up? It's not picking up because banks are lending to the private sector. They are hands tied in many ways because of regulation. It's because they're effectively de facto lending to the public sector. They're starting to fund these big deficits. And this is bad news for the long-term health of the US economy. Yeah, actually, I want to recommend a conversation I had with Charles Calamiris. I think it was in August of last year where he talked at length with us about how he expects or one way for the government to fund its deficit is to effectively commandeer the banking system and to use their capital to fund the deficit. Yeah, absolutely right. I listened to that. They 100% agree. This is the danger and this is what's happening. And what you're now hearing is debate going on between the lines, which is basically saying, why don't we allow the banks or encourage the banks to own more treasuries? Well, you know, lo and behold, guess what happened in World War II or in the British case in World War I? What you saw was the banks own lots of treasury securities. And that's war finance. So what I guess two questions. The first one is, what are the consequences to the real economy of this kind of suppression continuing? In other words, having this kind of distortion in duration, because interest rates on government bonds have an important influence on interest rates across the economy. Correct. And I think the danger is, I mean, we can go back in history and look at why there is the obsession among the economics profession for interest rates. And my view is that that's wrong. There's too much fixation on interest rates, so much so that the Federal Reserve you know, gets in a, in a lather about the dot plot and everyone in the market tends to focus an awful lot on the dot plot diagram about what the FOMC are thinking rates are going to be, et cetera, fine tuning it. But look, you know, hang it. Over the last 18 months, what you've seen is liquidity expanding. The market's gone up. Through that period, uh, policy rate expectations have flip-flopped from one side to the other, saying rates are going up, rates are collapsing, rates are going up. That hasn't really affected the market. What's driven the market is the flow of liquidity. You know, hang the interest rate argument. And if you go back to interest rates, I think the problem is, which is reinforced by this current debate about R-star, which is complete fiction in my view. There's no R-star out there. R-star is the normal Yeah, is what they think is the equilibrium interest rate. Well, there's no equilibrium interest rate. I mean, it's a fiction. And it goes back to the idea, right back to John Maynard Keynes back in the 1930s, who basically said, well, look, what we want to do here is to get interest rates down to zero because we then achieve the euthanasia of the rentier class. And that was one of the things he wanted to do. In other words, people living off interest, just get rid of them by getting interest rates down to zero. There's been this sort of fixation ever since about interest rates being important, and let's have low interest rates. That's what the R-star debate is about. But that's the problem, because you get interest rates down to such low levels, you incentivize people to get more debt. And debt it is It feels the like in a way we've actually done the opposite. It feels like what we've done is we've raised the Fed funds rate and interest rate costs for consumers and small businesses, while at the same time we've increased liquidity for asset holders. In other words, it seems like there are two approaches here where we're tightening financial conditions for the mainstream economy and loosening them for the financial one. So what's the logic behind that? Is it a desire to bring down consumer price inflation without taking the punch bowl away for anyone who owns financial assets? Or is it just a general concern about maintaining broader financial stability? Well, I think the, I mean, it's very difficult to sort of to read what the Fed is really thinking about why it's using the interest rate lever. But I would imagine because they feel that Fed funds rate is a very important lever to control the economy. 
And they thought by increasing interest rates, what you're likely to do is to slow the economy significantly, because maybe that's what the textbooks say. The reality is that what's happening in America is that fiscal policy is so loose, okay, with a deficit, budget deficit running on, you know, close to 8% of GDP, it's a huge, huge fillip to the domestic economy. And that's what you're seeing. How much is also that a lot of businesses, small businesses, consumers have long duration loans at lower interest rates, and they really haven't had the need to refinance. And is that a concern that if interest rates remain high long enough, that eventually it's going to impact the economy because a lot of people are going to have to refinance at higher rates? Yeah, I've got sympathy with that view, Dimitri. I think that that's quite feasible. The problem is, is that the longer you have interest rates at high levels, the more you hit the small to medium sized business sector. And that matters a lot for US productivity in the longer term. Okay. But, you know, at some stage, we've got to address this point about debt, about trying to disincentivize debt. And what I would argue is that there is some level, some happy medium of interest rates probably out there, which is, you know, maybe call that a kind of Goldilocks uh, view of interest rates that doesn't incentivize debt too much, but doesn't penalize the small to medium sized business community in terms of its productivity and its capital spending. But I think the reality is what you can't see is interest rates coming down a lot from here. Certainly, that would be my view. I think they stay higher for much longer. So let's go back to the to the yield curve. Historically, what is the mix between bills and bonds issued by the Treasury to fund the deficit? Well, I mean, the, the benchmark that people typically use is 80-20 coupon bills. 80-20 long to short-term duration. Yeah, Treasury bills 20% and coupon debt 80%. And that flipped pretty much almost exactly you know, 180 degrees in the last six months. Okay, so what happens when... I mean, is there any intention to normalize that distribution to go back to being something closer to what it used to be? And if so, how does that impact the long end of the curve? Well, there is an intention because that's what the Treasury is stating. It would like to get back to those sort of levels. I think there is a debate out there to be had about specifically what the ideal mix is. But the benchmark has always been the unwritten benchmark, let's say, has always been 80-20. As I say, they temporarily changed that in the last year or so. And they're moving back towards maybe a a more normal situation. But the debate is not just simply about bills and coupons. I think the debate has got to be about, you know, if you look at the distribution of coupons, are you funding at the 30-year, the 20-year or the 10-year tenor? Or are you going right down to the two-year, three-year, five-year maturity tenors? And those shorter dated tenors are much, much more attractive to credit providers like banks and money funds. Now, if you're selling debt to those credit providers, that is pure monetization. Right. So I guess my question is, where do we go from here in terms of financing the deficit? Because it seems that, first of all, from what you said, we've seen an inversion in the yield curve because the government has favored bill issuance as opposed to bond issuance. If the Fed were going to start to issue more bonds, presumably the opposite would happen. The yield curve would steepen. I mean, that also would kind of throw the government's finances into disarray. But to your earlier point, debt monetization seems to be the path forward. So does it really matter at the end of the day? Because one way or the other, the government's going to finance its own deficits. It's going to monetize the debt. Yeah. I mean, there's a an old saying in Ireland is that, you know, for the lost travelers, if you want to get to Dublin, don't start from here. And that's the reality that most Western governments have got to face. Now, I'm not hitting on the US because the US is the cleanest shirt in the laundry by far. A lot of other countries are in far, far worse shape. The reason that the US is maybe easy to pick on is that the US is very transparent in terms of its future finances. So so the Congressional Budget Office does a brilliant job in actually projecting uh, debt out to 2050 and in detail over the next 10 years. So you pretty much know what's coming. Now, people can argue that the CBO is conservative, and in certain areas it probably is, but it's a pretty decent benchmark. And those numbers that it projects are really quite scary. And that's the reality. You're looking at deficits, you know, eight, nine percent of GDP going out into the foreseeable future. And that is something that if you look back, if you go back, as I say, 20 years ago, you said that people have thought you're crazy to project those sort of numbers. But that's the reality we face. So I think you fall within the camp of people who view QE as actually a policy that raises term premia, counterintuitively for people, because most people think QE actually lowers rates. But 
the arguments of people like you fall in the camp of those who believe that QE actually raises interest rates because it creates a risk on environment. But how does that square with the government monetizing its debt? I mean, doesn't the government just become the larger purchaser of government debt and yields are therefore kept low? Yeah, but we sort of go back to an Alice in Wonderland world where Alice said to the Red Queen, you've got to run faster just to stand still. And I think that's the reality is that, okay, if the Fed starts to purchase treasuries, okay, by definition, if it's taking treasury supply out of the system, it must, by demanding treasuries, be pushing their prices up and capping their yields. I'll come quietly on that. But at the same time, it's issuing liquidity into the system. And as more liquidity goes into the system, investors don't want to take risk and they don't have any demand for safe assets. So their demand for safe assets crumbles. And if you look at all these studies that are done by the Federal Reserve, by academic economists and whatever else, what they're looking at purely is the supply impact of central bank purchases of treasuries on term premium. They're not looking at the second round effects that come through as the private sector says, well, uh, hey, we've got no need for these safe assets now. We'd rather have Bitcoin. Yeah, exactly. Well, wouldn't you? Yeah, at the limit. Uh, the last thing I want to own is US government debt. So like, is this another way of saying that this is the Japanification of the US bond market that we're seeing in the United States, what we saw roughly in Japan just in you know several decades earlier? Yes, but there's a very important point that comes with that observation, which is the critical one. And this is what I guess... Treasury officials or Fed officials have woken up to. Did it matter? Did what matter? Did the Japanification matter for Japan? The, you end up with the Bank of Japan owning most of the debt. Okay, fine. But you know what's the cost to the Japanese economy? Now, I would argue the cost is that the Japanese economy is a slow growth economy that's going to be very difficult for it to pick up because you've got this huge burden of debt to fund and the government is monetizing that. But in terms of the implications for, you know, there's been no recession, inflation hasn't picked up materially, interest rates remain pretty benign, the economy just rolls on. I mean, it's not a disaster scenario. And right. you know, this is the fact that if the US starts to monetize debt, which we're arguing it is, that's the reality. You don't want to go to a hyperinflation state or deep recession. What you're going to do is the can is kicked down the road. You get a higher level of inflation. And ultimately, you know, as my friend and your friend Russell Napier says, this is financial repression. So basically, people who are debt holders lose out over the over the longer term. Yeah, our episodes with Russell are also fantastic. Those will all be in the related section to this week's episode page. It's kind of the, isn't it Lawrence Summers that coined the phrase glorious deleveraging? Yeah, I think he probably was, yeah. Well, in any case, I mean, that's sort of the the intention there, but the demographics are very different in Japan. We have tons of immigration here. So I wonder if we can actually accomplish that without much higher levels of inflation in the United States. Yeah, it's quite possible. I'm, I'm not in the camp that says that you get very high inflation. I think you'll get some seepage of this liquidity. It will spill over. Monetary inflation is a component of high street inflation. It's not the only factor. High street inflation is a hybrid cocktail of both monetary inflation, which is devaluing paper money, and cost factors. So if you get oil prices suddenly collapsing, or you get a big productivity shock, or the Chinese help us out by cutting their prices, then you're going to see cost deflation in the high street. And that basically means high street inflation is not so badly affected. But equally, it can go the other way. So you know what we're saying to our clients is, look, what you want in this environment are monetary inflation hedges. So what you want are things like gold, which is a, a long-standing monetary inflation hedge, or Bitcoin, which seems to be actually acting like exponential gold. It's a sort of becoming a monetary inflation hedge par excellence. Yeah, we're, we're definitely going to have a chance to talk about asset allocation. So is it just me, or is the Fed collaborating with the Treasury more than it has in any in the last at least in the last 40 years. I mean, in my entire lifetime, I don't feel like I've seen this. I don't know if it's all the talk about the TGA and bill versus coupon issuance, but it seems like there's much more collaboration and the Treasury is playing a much bigger role than it has in the past in areas that traditionally we think of in monetary policy terms. I would agree 100 percent. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, Janet is you know, one of the most political treasury secretaries I can remember. Right, former Fed chairman. Yeah, she's also got a lot of experience in the Fed. So she knows both institutions inside out. You know, I'm pretty sure that they're collaborating closely. Why shouldn't they? It would be crazy if they didn't. 
So what does that tell us about the future of economic policy? You mentioned Russell Napier. Russell Napier talks about dirigest economic policies. He also talks about the corollary of that, which is industrial policy. Where do you see this taking us? Are we going to see increasingly no differentiation or are we going to see a situation where the separation of the treasury and the Federal Reserve is going to be all but in name and really we're going to have a world that's much closer to what the modern monetary theorists have actually been calling for? I think that's where we are now, to be truthful. I think we are in a, in that situation. The Fed is a much more political institution than it has been, in, certainly in, in my estimation. So I think we're there. But I think you know the reality is, and I keep coming back to this, is you know, where we are is in, we're in a monetary inflation regime. That doesn't mean to say you're going to get hyperinflation in the high street. It does probably mean you get a higher level of inflation running on. So it's not going to be you know two three percent that we've been used to in the last decade. It's more likely to be in the sort of five maybe six percent. But that's not hyperinflation. But it does mean that if you're a debt holder, your wealth gets progressively eroded. And that's the reality. Now, I think you've got to extrapolate that globally and then say, well, OK, how does America hold up in that environment? Because America basically has to sell debt, but then so do many other countries. And, you know, if the dollar is the cleanest shirt in the laundry, as I've said, against other units like the euro or the yen or sterling pound, then the US is going to fare better than these other countries. And their ability to fund is going to be compromised. So, you know, my feeling is here is one of the reasons that I'm optimistic on liquidity conditions over the next 12 months, is that I think what you've got now is a situation whereby the US is increasing liquidity. I think it's going to have to. I think the dollar may come under some pressure, downward pressure, particularly as we near the election, when a lot of the, you know, the uncertainty grows, what the outlook for the US is, the fiscal balance, whatever it may be, geopolitics, the dollar may come off. And the question is, what do other countries do? Do they let their units appreciate against the dollar? I don't think they do. I think they go down with the dollar. So what you're looking at is a general rise, in my view, in these monetary inflation hedges worldwide, viz gold and viz Bitcoin. Now, the big question to ask for everybody is, and this goes against what the economists are saying, but the market's always more important. You know, We never use economics to forecast the market. We use the market to try and understand the economy. And basically what you've got is a whopping great disconnect now between the gold price and real interest rates. For example, the US TIPS yield, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. Now, if you look at what the TIPS yield normally does, as the TIPS yield rises, the cost of carry for gold goes up and the gold price tends to drop. Okay, And if the TIPS yield falls, you get the opposite and the gold price goes up. The disconnect between rising real interest rates, tips yields, and a rising gold price is a big anomaly right now. It's been going on for, what, since probably late 22, and that gap has widened. What it tells you, what economists would say is, look, the real interest rate is there. It's a fact. The gold price is 20% plus overvalued. I think the opposite is the case. And the disconnect between gold and real interest rates is telling you something really important. People are buying gold because gold is a monetary inflation hedge. The cycle in gold is determined by real interest rates. The trend in gold is determined by monetary inflation. And we've got monetary inflation. So I don't have the gold chart in front of me, but I think the tips yields peaked at around, what, 2.5 or something back in the fall of last year. Is that right? Yeah. When did we start to see this big move in gold? Well, I think we're seeing it now. Okay. So there's a bit of a lag. Anyway, I'm just trying to draw a correlation to your point about the price of tips. Yeah. I mean, there has been a disconnect for some time. But I mean, basically what you're seeing now is maybe a widening of the jaws between the gold price and what the tips market's saying. Yeah. Well, we're certainly seeing a tight correlation between gold and Bitcoin. So something's going on. I'd also throw in just in terms of some statistical analysis that we do. So we've got a global liquidity data series, which is weekly. And we find, if you do econometric analysis on that, that Bitcoin follows global liquidity, our weekly index, by about six weeks. Okay, So it's a really good tracker of liquidity. Is it a better tracker than gold? Yes. Well, time will tell. But gold tends to move about six months later. And that is still on track. So in other words, you would have expected in this cycle, if this is correct, that Bitcoin moved ahead of gold. 
maybe you know two or three months or a few months ahead of gold. Seems to be exactly what's going on. So how far back does this tighter correlation between liquidity and Bitcoin, or is this just for true for Bitcoin? Or is it true for crypto in general? How long has this correlation been tighter for this category than it has been for gold? Well, it's, I mean, the relationship between Bitcoin, uh, because I've only looked at Bitcoin, to be truthful, Bitcoin and liquidity pretty much goes back to, let's say, circa 2015, where you started to get decent data on Bitcoin. Now, for a study, that's a short sample, but it is weekly data since 2015. And what it shows is if you look at a at a multiplier or a loading coefficient on, let's say, if liquidity goes up 10%, how much does Bitcoin go up? The loading is something like five times, okay? Huge, in other words. If you look at the same loading for gold, it's somewhere between 1.2 and 1.5. So for every 10% increase in liquidity, you get a 12 to 15% increase in gold. But for Bitcoin, it's been hugely more, which is why I use the term exponential gold. That's how it's behaved. Now, clearly, there's a take-up effect on Bitcoin. So you'd expect that coefficient to come down over time. But at the moment, it's still pretty high and it's acting that same way. So why is Bitcoin going up? Because there's lots of liquidity in the system. That defies what or denies what the Federal Reserve says. They're tightening liquidity conditions. Believe me, they're not. Just look at other indicators like the Goldman Sachs Financial Conditions Index. I mean, that tells you that monetary conditions are pretty easy. And one of the questions to ask, perhaps, is, well, why is this going on? Why is the Fed in denial? It's saying, on the one hand, it's tightening. But the reality is everyone knows that monetary conditions are pretty easy. And I reckon it's about financial stability. They want to make sure there is not another regional banking problem ahead of the election. Yeah, I hope that this conversation so far has been clarifying for people who are looking around and saying, I thought the Fed was raising interest rates. Why are we in an expansion? (laughs) The Fed's balance sheet, I believe it's been contracting for about a year. Maybe it goes back to April last year. Has all of that been run off? In other words, has all of that been expiring debt or has any of it been actual outright sales by the Fed? No, it's been they've they've been rolling off treasuries. That's for sure. I mean, they've done what the what the label says on the tin. They've allowed treasuries to roll off. The rate of roll off that we've had in reality, there's a shortfall which what they originally suggested would happen, and that was I, I would figure largely a result of the SVB crisis, where it seemed that they were soft pedaling then in terms of the roll off, and they'd already caught up. So they're about on our reckoning, about a trillion adrift of maybe where they should be in terms of the roll-off. But they've certainly been a lot more hesitant in allowing the balance sheet to contract than they were in letting the balance sheet expand the other side of COVID. And I think it should be obvious to everyone that you don't think they're going to be actually engaging in quantitative tightening. So in fact, quite the opposite. So first of all, is that correct? And then when do you expect QE to start And what is it going to look like? Is it going to be branded in the same way that it has been in the past? Or is it going to be introduced in a different way, similarly in a sense to how yield curve control has been introduced, right? You call it not yield curve control. So is something similar going to happen with QE? Yeah. I mean, the acronym department of the Federal Reserve is clearly working overtime here in terms of sort of thinking of a new name. But you know, what I would argue is that, you know, what the Fed has been doing is what they claim is QT, and that is letting debt roll off the balance sheet. Okay, I'm not going to argue with that. What my disagreement is, is that's that's not what we originally thought of as, as QE or QT, because on the other side, QE was all about liquidity expanding. It wasn't about how many treasuries the Fed held. QT is about the number of treasuries they hold. So they're, they're nuancing what they mean by QT, because the reality is that the balance sheet has shrunk and I make no question about that, can't deny that, that's a fact. But liquidity, Fed liquidity has increased. And in a book I wrote back about, what, almost five years ago, or five years ago, called Capital Wars, we detailed what we meant by Fed liquidity. And Fed liquidity is components of the Fed balance sheet that create liquidity. And that came from you know, my original teachings uh, or learnings when I was at Salomon Brothers. That's what Henry Kaufman and his team used to look very closely at when they did Fed watching. And effectively, that's now been taken up. And a lot of people publish on Twitter or wherever measures of Fed liquidity. So Michael, I'm going to move us to the second hour. As I said, I definitely want to get into asset allocation. I want to get a sense of what assets you think are going to be better performers in 2024 and 2025. I also 
would like to know, I mean, we've talked a little bit about the normalization of the yield curve, but I'd like to know where you think yields are going and in what time frame. Like, where are we going to be by the end of this year? Also, we just passed the date where the Treasury said that they would no longer be issuing new loans through the bank term funding program. Is that right? Correct. So I'm curious to understand what the impact of that is. Also, it's tax season, so people are going to be sending money to the government. The TGA is going to be filling up. That typically is net negative on liquidity. So I guess that's one way of asking, even though you see long-term liquidity rising, QE expanding, are we going to see a dip in the short term? What are the implications of that? Also, where are Fed funds rates going? The market's been kind of all over the place and they've been consistently behind the Fed. The Fed has kept rates higher for longer than people expected. So I'm curious to know where you think that's going. And like I said, I want to end on asset allocation, gold, Bitcoin, resources, commodities. I'm interested in talking about all of that. For anyone who is new to the program, Hidden Forces is listener supported. We don't accept advertisers or commercial sponsors. The entire show is funded from top to bottom by listeners like you. If you want access to the second hour of today's conversation with Michael, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and sign up to one of our three content tiers. All subscribers gain access to our premium feed, which you can use to listen to the rest of today's conversation on your mobile device using your favorite podcast app, just like you're listening to this episode right now. Michael, stick around. We're going to move the rest of our conversation onto the premium feed. If you want to listen in on the rest of today's conversation, head over to hiddenforces.io slash subscribe and join our premium feed. If you want to join in on the conversation and become a member of the Hidden Forces Genius Community, you can also do that through our subscriber page. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stilianos Nicolaou. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforces.io. You can follow me on Twitter at Kofinas, and you can email me at info at hiddenforces.io. As always, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. 